Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm always so uh, happy to be here. Um, it just kind of feels like like a lot of home. And um, as Andrew said, I, I work for Mozilla, and it is an amazing thing to be able to work for an organization that, well before I ever showed up, when they sat down to do a very boring task, which is write to the IRS and write out you know, what would be their articles of incorporation as a nonprofit, said, we're here to guard the open nature of the internet. And that's what I want to talk about today, how it is really on all of us, and I think there are many of us in the room, maybe all of us in the room who are doing that, guarding the open nature of the internet. And I want to talk specifically about the evolution of the open internet movement over the last 10 or 15 years, where we are and where we need to go. And in particular about the idea, and this is where I'm putting a lot of my time right now, that we need to make the health of the open internet a mainstream social issue, really at the same level as the environment. We need that level of ambition. So I want to talk about maybe how we get there as well as where we've come from. But maybe just a little poll. So how many people in the audience would say you're, you're kind of part of the open internet movement? You do open source, you signed a SOPA petition, you know about net neutrality, you've talked to encryption with your friends, like you're doing civic technology. So you're in the maker movement. So you know, I'm, I'm among friends and there are a lot of us who champion the values that, that underpin the internet. Uh, and I think that is exciting. We're at a great moment. And I think, you know, you know, if you're a part of this, that the internet's much more than technology. It's what Yvette does, it's about human experience, it's about having a voice, uh, it's about creating opportunity. Having a free and open internet is a thing that actually creates many of the things that we all stand for uh, in our lives. But you also know that, you know, we're at a spot, as Andrew says, in the moment of the internet, where governments are making very shitty laws. Sometimes because they want to crack down, but sometimes because they're just uninformed or, or a little bit stupid listening to corporate interests. And we also live in a world of, of walled gardens and growing monopolies, not necessarily the companies that have it out for us, but where they've got too much power. And you know, one of the things, there was a, I think it's just in the last few days, the decentralized web uh, summit that Tim Berners-Lee organized with the Internet Archive, um, in San Francisco, and talking about how we, really with the web, we built a surveillance system for ourselves that we never ever, in fact, George Orwell never ever could have imagined. So there's a lot of challenges to the things we stand for and love about the open internet. And that is why we need to be more ambitious and stand up as a movement that believes the internet should remain open and free. And in order to kind of talk about that, I want to draw a little parallel. I want to do a, a quick, three minute, five minute tour of the American environmental movement or the environmental movement in general. And I think there's some corollaries there, both in terms of you know, standing for forests instead of clear cutting, finding balance as we stand for privacy rather than surveillance. But also social movements actually have their ebbs and flows. And that's true in the environmental movement uh, as well. And so it's good to look at some parallels because for me, it gives me hope and direction about where we should go. So if you think back, environmental movement really starts uh, in the industrial era. You know, we're, we're clear cutting, we're building factories in, in Europe, in North America, um, and nobody's really thinking about the planet. Uh, and then a few people start to. So Thoreau, sitting in his little cabin, starts to say, well, we want to actually have some balance between progress and nature. You know, it's all in the name of progress. We don't think about these things. But there's not really any environmental activists around. Or you may not think there were. But actually, pretty quickly after Thoreau and in response to what's going on, you get, this is Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir, who founds the Sierra Club in, in the late 19th century. You actually get the conservation movement coming up very early saying, we actually do need to, as Thoreau said, balance progress and nature. And it's tremendous, you know, we don't think of maybe the Sierra Club in that early time as being an activist organization, um, you know, it was, a, it was a group of hikers. But it was a group of hikers that with Roosevelt and others created the national park system as a, counteract, a way to counteract that kind of clear cutting you just saw in the next picture. And from the late 19th century until the, the pre-war, pre-World War II period, you really have this growth of an amazing national park system without citizen activism wouldn't exist. And we take it for granted today 
that nature is preserved in that way. And so that's really the first wave of very effective citizen activism in the US environmental movement, the conservation movement in the first half of the 20th century. There's a big win early on. You've got something established, some, some roots of the modern environmental movement and some real victories. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that all is great for the planet. You know, we get to the post-war period and things are a little different, or certainly they continue on in, in a negative trajectory. And this is a real advertisement, right, from the 50s. So we're, we're paving our farmlands and creating suburbs, we're selling more automobiles, we're shutting down public transportation systems, we're building chemical factories, nuclear factories, and we're spaying DDT on our children, our food, and our dogs. So, you know, it, the environmental movement may have had a peak uh, in the pre-war period as the conservation movement, but really the, the kind of industrial travesty on the planet continues and grows. And so, you know, like the Thoreau of Herrera, Richard Carson comes up and says, hey, wait a second. You know, all this DDT shit, all this idea that chemicals are going to save things is actually hurting us and the planet, and we need to pay attention and stop and do something about it. And nobody was really thinking about that. They were just spraying DDT on their, their pets. Uh, it takes you know, a, a few minds to step forward and, and say this. And really with Rachel Carson and, and her peers, you start to see the growth of the modern environmental movement. And citizens, again, in a new way, start to take on companies, take on just actually the ideology that you know, chemicals and consumer society should go on you know, and unchecked. And you know we, we probably take it for granted today, but before that time, if you think of the, the pre-war era or even into the 60s and 70s, we don't have you know ministers or secretaries of the environment. We don't have the Environmental Protection Agency. We don't have you know a big movement beyond conservationism. We certainly don't have green products. Uh, all of those things really come because there's this upswell of a citizen movement in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And the result of that is, you know, not just good regulation, but that actually our expectations, and that's important when you think about the internet too, our expectations of how things should work and what is, you know, legit as an issue and what we want as consumers really shift as a part of this citizen movement. I think they really can take credit. And so, you know, it may be that you're cynical about uh, electric cars or hybrids or green products, but we actually have gotten to the point where the, the goals of that movement, really the seeds from Thoreau and Rachel Carson, start to become a mainstream part of the conversation and impact the economy and government and how we make decisions every day. And we really get to the point where the health of the planet is a mainstream issue. So let me just do another poll, just to test, I could be wrong. How many people in the audience just are full-time and paid environmentalists? Okay, not very many. How many people have ever bought an organic product? Keep your hand up, got a hybrid car, uh, signed a petition for Greenpeace. So this is actually in a room of technologists and, and internet policy and tech people, that is a mainstream issue. If we went to an environmental conference, how many people do you think would put up their hand and say, hey, yeah, I'm here as a part of the open internet movement? Almost none of them. So that's the challenge that we can take inspiration from the environmental movement. How do we actually take what we care about, the health of the internet, and get it to that point, get it to this point? And I think we can, and I think we have the roots and the seeds to do that. So just quickly, this is, as Andrew said, I actually have been doing this for over 20 years. This is my first website that had stuff on net culture and the Canadian information highway policy of the time. Um, but the beautiful thing about it, you can still find this in the Wayback Machine, that's where I got it. Um, you know, the beautiful thing is everybody had a web page, right? And they were on GeoCities and Tripod and all these places. It was just a bubbling field of creativity and that was what was exciting about the internet right then. And the, the intellectual leaders of the time, this is John Perry Barlow's Declaration for Independence of Cyberspace, thought, great, look, we can do anything we want. You know, you governments of the industrial world, weary giants of flesh and seal, fuck off. <laughs> and like, we're gonna do what we want. And that, you know, that was a great moment, right? We would do whatever we want. But of course, it doesn't actually work out that way. And in fact, quite quickly, you see that 
you know, Netscape is the is the light blue. You know, one company comes in from nothing, from nowhere, and takes over the internet, which is Microsoft. Uh, and that too much power over the internet, whether that's control over the actual browser on your computer or control over web standards, which are the substrate of an open web, uh, you know, Microsoft was using that power to take the internet in its direction. And in fact, you know, so much so the government noticed. And, you know, here's Bill Gates and his antitrust trial. Now, we turned that around, but it wasn't just the government. In fact, it was not primarily the government, I think, that turned around. It, there was a social movement of technologists who said, we are going to take on this empire and take the internet back. And that's the Linux community, the free software community, the open source community, and of course, Mozilla. And with Firefox coming out as the sort of first big open source consumer product, and this is the famous New York Times ad at the launch of, of Firefox 1.0, and on the, that side are the names of all the people who donated to put that ad in the Sunday New York Times. We had a social movement of technologists and regular users who said, no, we are taking back the web. And, you know, it turns out uh, we were successful at that. You know, you're now at the point where Firefox has surpassed Internet Explorer. Chrome has now probably got too much power. But the, the more important thing is the web and the standards and the openness behind it came back. And that, we, you know, had the great age of Ajax and apps and Facebook and Gmail, all those things as a result of that. So, you know, you had very quickly a moment of freedom, a monopoly emerges, and a citizen movement that literally does take back the web. Now, of course, you can't, as in the environmental movement, rest on your laurels. So I love this XKCD cartoon. Remember when we prosecuted Microsoft for bundling a browser with an OS? Imagine a future we'd live in if we'd been willing to let one tech company amass that much power. <laughs> Thank God that didn't happen. So, you know, we're at a spot where whether it's companies or the monopolies, we are back in the spot where two or three companies do have that much power. And not only do they have that much power, and I think it is bad for the internet, it is bad for hyperlinking, it is ha bad for openness, it is bad for competition, it is bad for all kinds of things. In addition to those monopolies and their power, the expectations that users have of the internet, so that's that idea of what do we expect are changing. So there's all kinds of evidence that we've seen, and this is an article from Quartz, that Facebook users uh, who get their first time smartphones in, in many emerging markets don't even know that Facebook is a part of the internet. And so we're at a spot where what the imaginable is actually being shut down by those monopolies, where we can only imagine them as our digital reality. And luckily, we have had our Rachel Carson, I believe, and Snowden was him. And we have started to reemerge in that conversation where the surveillance and the monopolies and the government control are things that we can challenge. And we have challenged it. We challenged it with SOPA, we challenged it with ACTA, we challenged it with net neutrality, and you'll see this more and more. And there are many colleagues in the room who work with Mozilla as a part of fueling an open internet movement. And that to me is exciting. And it meant that we were there for net neutrality and we won. And it meant we were there when the Apple FBI came out and we all had a chance to actually bring some of these issues around encryption to the forefront. So we're actually on an upswing, but we are not ambitious enough. We are not nearly, nearly ambitious enough. If we want this issue to be mainstream, we actually need to be more ambitious and have that as our target. We're still playing in the minor leagues. So one of the things we believe we need to do, and we want to call everyone who, who we work with, everyone in the room, to work with us on this idea, is let's actually look at other movements, like the environmental movement, like the anti-smoking movement, like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and bring these issues into the mainstream where everybody understands what's at stake with the internet, that what they love about it is at risk, and that they actually can take control of their privacy, can actually influence where the internet goes. And one of the things we started to do, and it happened to come out, uh, during the Apple FBI case uh, was doing this basic social marketing around the issue of encryption, what it is and why it matters. We all need to be doing more of that. So 
really my call to action as I end is, let us all engage in making the health of the internet a mainstream social issue. Is how I am now spending all of my time as executive director of Mozilla, is something for the next three years at least that we'll put about $20 million into, and it's something we're trying to find allies, uh, you know, likely or unlikely to work on. So my invitation to ask for you is, as an open internet movement, whether you're working in civic tech, open source, or directly on internet policy issues, let's get ambitious together, and let's actually make the open internet a mainstream issue that absolutely everyone cares about. Thanks very much.